Hallo, hallo. So, thank you very much. I am going to open this conference in uh, English, English language. So I was asked to open it because the chairman of the German Pirate Party is on his way in a traffic jam. So, um, well, who am I? I am the vice chairman of the Pirate Party's International. My name is Patrick Schiffer. Uh, I'm also the uh, board chairman of the board of the North Rhine-Westphalian Pirate Party. And I open this security conference here in Munich. It's a side event of the official uh, Munich security conference. Um, the people who are organizing it uh, are the pirate parties of Germany, Luxembourg, uh, Switzerland, and Luxembourg. Um, we are also uh, working together with the Association 42, it's a German association, who are organizing this event as well. Uh, the name of this security conference is uh, New Horizon in Security Politics. And it's all about security. Uh, you all have the program. Uh, there's the, the whole program of the coming two day, three days from 11 to 13th February. So it's about critical infrastructure, about uh, autonomous cars, about digital uh, media, um, digital weapons, war on terrorism and its consequences. So we are going to talk a lot about all those issues and I'm really proud about greeting you as the guests for this conference and yeah, let's start. So as I'm also the moderator of the first panel, uh, I proudly present to you two very important pirates in the pirate movement, uh, Birgitte Jonsdottir, she's member of the Icelandic Parliament, National Parliament, and Jelena Jovanovic, she's member of the Pirate Party Serbia and Media Communication Manager of the Pirate Parties International. I will start with uh, Birgitta and introducing her, who she is and what she's doing. Birgitta was born in 1967, she's member of the Althing, it's uh, the name of the Icelandic parliament. She's there since April 2009, and she was re-elected there for the Pirate Party in 2013. Um, she's uh, representing also uh, and co-founded also the movement. It's uh, a kind of NGO in uh, Iceland. In the wake of the financial crisis in Iceland 2013, she was elected of, on behalf of uh, the movement to our thing and then went to Pirate Party Iceland. Um, yeah, she was a spokesperson and an activist uh, for various groups, uh, especially for WikiLeaks. She worked as a volunteer. She was working for Saving Iceland. She's co-founder of an international uh, modern media institute uh, where she's actual also the chairwoman. Uh, she works as a poet, as a writer, artist, editor, and publisher and activist. She was founding uh, the organization Beyond Border Press and Radical Creations. She was uh, also, that's very interesting, maybe you don't know, uh, co-producing -pro the Collateral Murder video, which made WikiLeaks very, uh, yeah, very important. Um, there's one very interesting uh, security uh, thing of, uh, of her, because 2011, uh, Twitter was demanded uh, to inform the US Department of Justice for all uh, the information about her on Twitter. So that means they ask about email, email um, addresses, uh, the billing information, connections, session times, and IP addresses. So uh, another thing is she joined uh, an Icelandic whistleblowing initiative 2012 and since 2013 she's member of the Icelandic delegation to International Parliamentary Union um, where she wrote um, a piece of paper calling democracy in the digital era and the threat to privacy and individual freedom. So that's I think a small overview of what Birgitta is doing and has done and is as a person really active pirate in our movement. I'm now talking about Jelena Jovanovic, a former member of the PPI board. PPI is called Pirate Parties International for those who don't know. 
she's a member of the Pirate Party Serbia, and she works as a media and communication manager uh, for the PPI. She's a media professional. Uh, she works as an activist, a writer, editor for several pol topics like information policy, information security, content marketing. Um, what you say about her is she founded several NGOs in Serbia, like uh, uh, association with a uh, trade union for journalists. She studied uh, philology at the University of Belgrade, and she's actually living and working in Belgrade. So the first panel um, is going about how digital media have changed the overall perception in the society. I probably present to you Birgitta Jonstotir and Jelena Jovanovic. We have a short minute to plug some chairs on the stage and some drinks, and then we start to discuss everything. Thank you. So we need two more people on the stage, please. And we need three microphones. Ah, perfect. Test, test. OK, thank you very much. So. Why is media changing the perception in society is our actual panel uh, topic. Uh, I will begin uh, to have uh, introduced Birgitta a little bit herself and what you're, what you're working on. So and later on, um, Jelena will do the same. And then we are going into some question we just prepared for this panel. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, guten Morgen. <laughs> uh, just one correction. Uh, I did not go from the other party to the Pirate Party. I helped co create the Pirate Party in Iceland because we dissolved the other, uh, the movement. It was uh, written in our. Um, hit and run checklist that we had to dissolve it if we were not successful. Um, so in 2012, the Icelandic Pirate Party was created. And currently, we've been in a very strange situation. Um, for a year, we have been in the polls, the biggest party in Iceland. Uh, and sort of the normal following is somewhere between 33 to 35%. Uh, and uh, it is. Um, creating very interesting debates in Iceland, because finally we are being able to discuss things that are important to pirates, uh, such as the topic of the resolution that I was tasked to write for the International Parliamentary Union. Uh, it was, it, the, many of you will not know what the International Parliamentary Union is. It is a union that uh, was established in 1889. Uh, it has 166 member countries. It has 1,000 parliamentarians that attend the assembly. So uh, when I was uh, given this task, uh, it was clear that this uh, resolution would be focused on Snowden's first interview in Hong Kong, uh, where he said that in order for us to um, deal with mass surveillance, we have to change both local laws and global, and we have to make encryption a standard, uh, easy to use day-to-day uh, -day activity with our digital media. And so I decided to do something about both the local and the global laws, and hence uh, at the IPU assembly last year in October, we got uh, the entire assembly focusing on 
digital uh, democracy in the digital era and the threat to privacy and individual freedoms, which uh, is, by the way, the first um, global pirate party resolution to be adopted because this resolution was adopted by a unanimous vote after dealing with 113 amendments, some really bad, but some really great, and somehow I managed to include the good ones and have the one bad ones voted down, which I still don't know how I did it. Uh, maybe because I had cracked rib and I wanted to get it over with very quickly. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to go through some of uh, the, f the stuff that we uh, agreed to do at the IPU. And I want you to be aware of that uh, Germany is a part of the IPU, and you need to urge your uh, national legislator to uh, uh, put forward a resolution or ask your interior minister where you stand in regard to the stuff that was adopted uh, at the IPU. So, <clears throat> urge this parliament to reject the interception of telecommunications and espionage activities by any state or non-state actor involved in any action which negatively affects international peace and security as well as civil and political rights, especially those enshrined in Article 12 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Article 17 of the International Convenient on Civil and Political Rights with states that no one shall be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his privacy, family, home, or correspondence, and that everyone has the right to the protection of the law against such interference or attacks recognizes the need for parliaments to specify in relative detail the circumstances under which any interference with the right to privacy may be permitted to establish strict judicial procedures from the authorization of communication surveillance and to monitor the implementation of these procedures, limits on the duration of surveillance, security and storage of the data collected and safeguards against abuse. Emphasizes that while national security arguments will invariable be advanced, that diverse digital technology tools may threaten the security and well-being of a state, parliaments need to review their capacity to oversee all executive action and ensure that a balance is struck between national security and individual freedoms so as to ensure that measures taken in the name of national security and counterterrorism comply strictly with human rights and avert any threats to democracy and human rights strongly urges, and this is important for you to get your parliament to acknowledge that they agreed to do this, strongly, strongly urges parliaments to review and establish effective, independent, and impartial oversight mechanisms where needed and include them in the legal framework. Stresses that parliaments must investigate any shortcomings in their oversight function and the reasons behind them, making sure that their oversight bodies, such as, a parliamentary, such as parliamentary committees, and parliamentary ombudsman have sufficient resources, proper authorization, and the requis requisite authority to review and publicly report on the actions of government agencies and or surveillance agencies acting on their behalf, including action in cooperation with foreign bodies through the exchange of information and joint operation. And this is uh, very much aimed at the so-called uh, five eyes. Uh, uh, where nations collaborate between agencies to uh, share uh, information about their citizens. Um, and here is another thing that is uh, important, calls on parliaments to acknowledge that civil society and public participation can play a vital role in monitoring the executive branch and encourages parliaments and parliamentarians to promote and engage in consultation and to welcome assistance from all stakeholders, including national human rights institutions, the private sector, civil society, the technical community, the academic community and users in the monitoring, policy making and policy implementation efforts. And uh, there are actually, and I'm not going to read all of this, uh, there are 25 suggestions on what uh, local parliaments need to do. You can find this if you go to en.immi.is, uh, and then you can find the entire resolutions and highlights from it. 
Uh, and the reason why I, I feel it's important that we uh, focus on this is that we also tackle uh, the need to protect whistleblowers locally and globally. Uh, I got uh, Mr. Snowden to read through the resolution before I uh, put it forward. So it is Snowden approved. <laughs> and he brought forward some very useful um, uh, suggestions. Um, and I find um, that we do not put enough focus or stress on the corporate sector. We focus very much on NSA and, uh, and similar agencies. Uh, we are aware of it uh, in general, but we are not aware of the incredible intrusion of uh, the corporations that collect our data. There is no transparency about the algorithms that are created by very big uh, social media sites and media sites or uh, uh, services that uh, are very inclusive of uh, most of our day-to-day -day activities. Uh, and um, I feel that it is important to strike some sort of balance between the awareness of how to tackle these uh, two different sectors who very often collaborate. So the amount of um, intrusive uh, surveillance is much deeper, and they even know things about us that we don't know ourselves. Uh, so the foundation for running a functional democracy is broken. And if we want to have a functional democracy, we have to fix this. And so uh, I call on everybody here to, uh, to uh, apply pressure on both your local um, representatives and to, uh, on the corporations that you're using day to day. So we will have a chance to uh, go deeper into that uh, later. But I think um, in regard to uh, the theme of this uh, panel, uh, it's also important to note that uh, uh, there is not enough done uh, in most parts of the world to encourage both uh, whistleblowers to come forward or protect them, and there is not enough done to uh, facilitate proper platforms for uh, investigative journalism. And so for me as a pirate who has in the core policy of our party in Iceland uh, that uh, in order to have uh, direct democracy or a functional society, we have to ensure that the general public is informed and information is the uh, only way for us to take uh, informed and enlightened uh, decisions and choices. And so uh, we have a lot of work and a lot of tasks ahead of us. And uh, I'm very uh, excited to see that the, um, um, that the topic of the core issues of the Pirate Party uh, are the central theme of this conference. And I want to thank the uh, Pirate Party in Germany, in Bavaria, for organizing this. So, but uh, I won't say any more now so that others can speak. Thank you very much, uh, Birgitta, for this short introduction. Uh, we got back on these topics later. I will probably present you, Jelena, and you will talk to us free on this mic, if you want. Um, yeah. I think this one is working right now. Yeah, OK. So I uh, would love to make just a short introduction, because I come from a country which is uh, basically marginalized in Europe, and it's Serbia. Uh, it's formally. A socialist country where people still believe, and I find that as a very nice thing, some people and some institutions still believe that state or country is here to protect ordinary people and not to get after them and not to breathe around their neck and track them all the time. So as a pirate, um, I have been organizing demonstrations and co-organizing demonstrations in Belgrade. Uh, first time during the anti-ACTA protest with, uh, with groups like um, Occupy, actually 99%, Anonymous Serbia and Wikimedia. 
uh, we did have a demonstration and full square, like main city square, full of people, and even the members of government in the audience because they wanted to know what we are going to talk about. I have to tell that uh, at that point, even OSC mediated because they thought, oh my God, this is going to escalate on the streets, violence because of copyright, which went unreformed for, for so many years. Um, as activist, I've been organizing demonstrations. Uh, some I can disclose, some I can't for um, reasons which you all probably are guessing. But um, what is important for me is to say that pirates do change things. And regardless of legal status of the organization or group uh, which within, within um, which what they're working in. So um, in Serbia, entry uh, barrier has raised recently and um, uh, forming a pirate party or the group who can go to elections is a little bit, well, not a little bit, it takes a small fortune to pay for the registration. And uh, also it takes uh, only a month to get 10,000 signatures for registering a party. Therefore, we, we operate as informal group and we're mostly activists. I go um, as a media professional, of course, I worked for many NGOs and I started few, but um, as an activist, I went a little bit deeper into technical issues like interception of traffic, interception of torrent traffic, and uh, what's happening with, um, with the internet service providers who are giving out our data without court warrant. Um, I guess you can find some things about me on SlideShare, Ms. Saibanaud. It's been presented on Balkan Hackers Congress, which happens every year in September. So um, as a pirates, we are really trying to put a highlight on issues like privacy, surveillance, and to help our government, because I told you it's formally a uh, socialist republic, so we still cooperate, and we don't have that many um, uh, bodies which are mediating our communication, so we can talk directly still. Um, I wanted to ask you how many of you in the audience are journalists or are coming from media or are having any relevant experience with the media? Okay, great. Um, I wanted to talk about today's society and information and news which arise from multiple sources. So they are spread around numerous channels from WikiLeaks to citizens media and to social media as well and traditional media. I would like to discuss with you and to, I would like you to take part in, in, the, next, um, in the next phase of, of panel discussion and to see how media are actually perceiving issues like, um, like hacktivism. Um, I would like to know what you think about hacking. Is it a way to increase government transparency, uh, maybe without their will or against their will? And what media can do to help people achieving more transparency? For me personally, I hold uh, firmly to believe that there should be a legal way to live an honest life um, out of leaking documents. And uh, because I'm a pirate, I can say that. But uh, still, there is a problem with a lot of people who are actually um, not selling their zero days to governments or to FBI. They're just sitting on them. And when they decide to use them, they do it for the people. And you can see mostly every day that some police files or military intelligence files are leaked. If you remember last year's World Cup, FIFA World Cup, and, and that huge hacking, hacking party, which <laughs> take, took a month with a, lot of, with a lot of videos and graphics, uh, maybe you can recall how many files about a private police was leaking and how we got to learn uh, who was training Hungarian police or Ukrainian police or American police and police in Brazil. So um, I see the media role um, in light of um, supporting whistleblowers or at least understanding what whistleblowing is and not judging hackers as cyber criminals. There is a huge discussion, there was a huge discussion a few years ago about what is the difference between a hacker and, uh, and a cyber criminal. And still some things are um, incriminated and it's not yet legal to leak documents for the, for the people's sake, right? So um, I would really like to know and to discuss with you where uh, is that line we should draw? Um, is it about police files? Is it about NGOs who are paid to hack Ukrainian government maybe? Um, is it uh, what gets in the news, how items are processed, uh, how can organization be protected, or what can pirates do for, for their protection? And of course, I really think that involvement of many of us is much better than control. 
by a few. And therefore, uh, therefore, I would encourage you to take part in our movement. And in global movements, we don't have frontiers. We are on the same boat as a people. So regardless of political affiliation or um, professional um, affiliation, I think we all need to join hands and to try to make this cyber cyberspace a little bit more predictable and um, to try to reduce misperception together, pirates and media, of course. Um, I'm here to try to see if there is an opportunity to build understanding and maybe to close digital divide between countries which are like pirate countries. We have, uh, at this moment, we have over 17, 70 countries in different stage of development worldwide, and a little bit above 40 which are official members of Pirate Parties International or uh, in a status of observer member. So we're talking about global asynchronic movement, which is doing the right thing, doing the same thing, uh, but without um, enough communication, especially if we're talking about English-speaking economies, and then we have Germany and Slavic nations. So um, I will just... Um, give the word to, to our moderator right now. And I would like to ask um, all journalists and media professionals to take part whenever they feel it's necessary. You don't have to wait for Q&A session or something like that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jelena. So um, I would um, begin uh, the talk about whistleblowers and how is their role in media, how is the connection what are your experiences uh, of the last, I will say, five years? Like there was Snowden, there was Thomas Drake, there were others. Um, there's Bradley Manning, all, all, all still sitting in jail. Um, and why is the media not, yeah, taking part in this really big, huge impact on how information is get into the public? Because I see there's a really difference between the traditional media talking about whistleblowers and you know cyber activists um p pirate politicians um yeah um Birgitta, what what's your experience with the with the question how the stance of whistleblowers is in that? all right uh so um I, when I participated in uh, co-producing uh, Collateral Murder uh, and uh, was working with a source whom I didn't know that later turned out to be Chelsea Manning, um, the media actually did use that uh, leak a lot. Uh, we did a very organized, coordinated um, uh, press conference in Washington <laughs> uh, to release the video and the media really... Uh, took it. Uh, however, when it came to support Chelsea Manning, the whistleblower, the source of the news that was revealing a war crime, uh, there was no support, uh, at least uh, in the uh, US media. And uh, this person, this whistleblower, was w vilified. I personally know a lot of um, whistleblowers like Thomas Drake and Kirioko and uh, and um, uh, when Snowden came forward, uh, he said he wanted to come to Iceland because of the work I'd been doing there with the Icelandic Motor Media Initiative. And unfortunately, there are no laws in place that will protect the whistleblower from being made stateless or uh, have their passport uh, taken away from them like Snowden. And that is uh, something that is actually included in this IP, IPU resolution, uh, a way to do that. Uh, if there are any other courageous whistleblowers. Now, the media has not uh, properly stood by um, other sort of lower level whistleblowers. Snowden is, of course, the biggest and highest level whistleblower that everybody is willing to uh, support, uh, in Europe at least. Uh, but I don't see much uh, written about the person that sort of broke the roof. <laughs> Uh, and that is Chelsea Manning. She will be in prison for 35 years for telling us the truth or revealing uh, what is going on in our name. I mean, we are NATO countries. Uh, and that means that uh, the horrible things happening in Afghanistan are our responsibility. And, um, and so 
I would call on media uh, in general to be more supportive of the sources of news that often are very highly clickable. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to media today and the way it's uh, moved from uh, analog to the digital, uh, the media is struggling still with finding ways to um, uh, have a financial profit. And that means that, uh, and also because of all these laws that uh, uh, are super injunctions and gag orders and uh, prior restraint, uh, it means that a lot of the stories that uh, should be in the public domain actually never get published because there are so many out-of-court settlements. And it is a lot easier to manipulate news uh, digitally than uh, when it's printed. And, um, and so there are the laws, as always, because um, uh, changing laws is like... Uh, uh, I don't know, it's more complicating than making a baby and delivering it. Uh, it's, uh, it's way behind. And so we also need to think about ways how we can modernize how laws are made. Uh, but it's actually gotten a lot worse. Uh, I come from a background of uh, citizen journalists going to protests and stuff like that and, and being... Uh, sort of on the first, uh, and the news from the, the floor when you're protesting uh, versus what the media, how the media depicts protesters is very different. So uh, unfortunately, I feel that uh, media is worse, except from uh, sort of uh, cooperative, cooperative and journalists uh, that are on the scene, and then you, can, then you can reflect that with mainstream media, and you can sort of get the truth somehow. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we all know um, the intercept, which uh, changed a lot in this uh, question. Um, my question to you, Je Jelena, you're uh, really active in social networks and you also see a lot of media taking place uh, about security issues. What's your experience uh, of the last whistleblower and their perception on society and, and how was what was the role of, of the digital media in, in this question, what did you did you view? Okay, I understand. Um, digital media have the key role in in the whole process of recognition uh, of trying to recognize whistleblowers as people who are actually doing good things for the mankind. Um, I wouldn't talk about international whistleblowers right now because it's still highly unregulated and people get prosecuted and hunted and they need to hide. But on a national level, um, I have to tell that um, the country where I come from uh, two years ago was uh, declared by Transparency International as a country with one of the best um, whistleblowers protection laws in the world. Uh, which means that process was, um, I think it took like more than two or three years and more than two years to get into the parliament procedure. There was a lot of conferences around that and of course there was media covering it in a way they could. So um, usually it wasn't media which were, which were financed by the state. Um, they were mostly collectives or, or NGOs working as media who were focusing on investigative journalism. And it all comes down to who is financing it at the very end. But um, what we had is like five years of a kind of campaign which was quite silent because we're talking about two or three institutions who could actually cover whistleblowing as a topic in the right way. But they have been publishing uh, PDFs and brochures with the case studies with real people and their real names. For instance, um, a law professor on the faculty who was uh, pointing out to some wrongdoings and then got harassed together with his family. Or um, a case about um, a refugee or asylum center on the border with, uh, with Macedonia where the women got beaten or pregnant women were forced to sleep in the woods. And I'm talking about period like three or four years ago. So it was happening uh, ongoing. And it was not covered by the mainstream media almost at all. So um, because of the structure of the investigative journalism collectives, uh, some media sometimes um, decided, some mainstream media, to cover it, but in really formal and a way which is not really like telling enough. So what people were doing on the internet and pirates as well were distributing th those PDF brochures and trying to disseminate information further and to point out what's happening with people who are actually appointing 
uh, highlighting that there is something wrong. So I see actually one issue there, um, two maybe. Uh, the first thing is that um, corporations should have roots the way for people who actually feel that there's something wrong to say it within the company to whatever, human resource manager or psychologist or open doors uh, policy is also very nice when you work for the company. But uh, the bigger problem is uh, what happens with people who are actually whistleblowers within um, law enforcement, military or intelligence. They usually don't have anyone to complain to and if they get, if they get any feedback it's from the um, direct supervisor and it's usually negative. So that's something we should work on, on a global level with all um, other groups of activists because it will take time and we need kind of global consensus that it's all right to point out to wrongdoings globally even if it's related to national security or military or law enforcement. So media role is that um, quite confusing because media usually stop when they have no interest to, to investigate further and this is where activists are actually having a key role. For instance, when, um, when Finn Fischer's story broke out in Serbia two years ago, uh, when Citizen Lab published the report and map with the first findings where Finn Fisher is sold. Um, you probably know Finn, Finn Fisher is a kind of malware which is sold to governments and deployed against citizens. So the price depends on how much governments can pay. But uh, my country was on that map and um, Share Foundation, uh, organization uh, which is um, consisting on, of, of lawyers basically and activists, they kind of tried to disseminate the news further and they found out that there was a private person who bought the software and they just gave it to the government. Um, we managed to locate the servers, we managed to find out who are internet service providers who are, who are in, that, in that business of spying on, on people. But what happened is that mainstream media published one article uncovering the topic and then the second article with a, with a person from military intelligence saying that everything is all right, you don't have to worry. <laughs> we are doing everything by the law, nothing to worry about. And then everything just stopped. So this is where citizen journalists actually can come up as a, as a source, especially in, in, in languages like, like English or German, because sometimes we need to make that kind of pressure on our government around around the country. I would not single out Serbia. I actually think that really many countries, I think for Finn Fischer it's like 47 or 43. I would not single out any country especially, but we need together uh, to put pressure on countries which are deploying malware against their own citizens. And also, uh, when we talk about terrorism, um, you can see in the media leftists having fights around that and uh, not having proper understanding of what's really going on, for instance, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in France, or in the Netherlands. So, um, though it, information cannot be, you know, might not be processed well or checked well, it should be taken into account. Um, as a media professional, I read everything. I read yellow press, I read mainstream media, I read blogs, and I read, of course, citizen journalism. And I think this is uh, how every human being should behave, because then you get different perspective and different outlook on, on the same events. And it's the same for security issues and terrorism, especially whistleblowing. I think the internet uh, has a key role there. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we are talking now about not only digital media in the classical way, like journalists uh, working for newspapers. So we changed a little to citizen journalism and also investigative journalists who are on their own, which are not supported by a big newspaper like Green, Glenn Greenwald, uh, a special role um, for The Guardian. But, uh, um, Birgitta, what's your experience with citizen journalism? Uh, how can we support them? How can we get them more influence on society? How can we um, yeah, just, you know, motivate people to be a citizen journalist? Because there's a big, there's a big issue on that. Everyone who's educated enough, who's um, connected to the internet, and there are three billion people now, uh, way too less, but they will grow. Um, what's your m uh, opinion on how the pirate movement or how the uh, politicians can support citizen journalism on a parliamentary way? Because they all work with the, I mean, classical media, but there's a kind of question: How transparent am I working, and how 
much possibilities are they to get all the information to also to to investigative journalists to normal german to to citizen journalists oh, wow <coughs> that is a very big question <laughs> uh, <coughs> i think uh it's important to note that it is important to have tra uh, trainings where people are trained to investigate. Uh, and one of the reasons why the WikiLeaks uh, documents uh, that Chelsea Manning provided did have a huge impact was because uh, WikiLeaks collaborated with established media like The Guardian and The Spiegel uh, and, and other uh, media outlets that have people that are trained in uh, pulling out uh, important facts. And uh, I cannot stress enough that you know, I, I, citizen journalism is both horribly bad uh, and, and really brilliant. And uh, I don't know how the Pirate Party could uh, support it more than simply focusing on creating a legal framework that uh, protects sources, encourages whistleblowing, protects uh, uh, intermediaries that are uh, hosting the citizen journalist blogs or, or, or media. Uh, and you can find all of these legal frameworks in the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, which was written to legalize uh, Wikileaks. And this is how I started to work with Wikileaks in 2009, was uh, to create the Switzerland of bits, a safe haven in Iceland for freedom of information and expression and speech with a strong focus on privacy. Back then we did not talk a lot about the situation with privacy because everybody would have thought I was crazy or paranoid. It wasn't until Snowden came forward that you could actually talk about the reality because before that, and this is a big problem, uh, you, if you, you know things and you're trying to tell and warn, uh, if you don't have the facta, if it's, um, if it's not leaked, and you can, uh, the journalists can actually see it and the legislators with their own eyes, then the danger is that you're going to be ridiculed. And so the legal uh, framework, the tolerance, we need to do, and I have to compliment Germany for having actually conducted the only really comprehensive study on how people uh, sense and, and uh, what they feel about privacy. Uh, because uh, privacy has changed so much uh, in this day and age, and most people are not aware of that they are always sleeping uh, with in a room with no curtains, where all the walls are uh, glass, and anybody can be watching them when they're sleeping. And and so we have to um, also be aware of a very important uh, part of this, and that is. We tend to, those of us that are trying to provide information and uh, share news stories and so forth, and of course the, the digital media has changed a lot, so you don't never read a whole newspaper anymore. You read snippets and, and different parts of stories from different media outlets. And, uh, and then when the media puts uh, paywalls, they often lose uh, readers. And we need to rethink the entire structure on how we access uh, both mainstream media and other platforms. Now we had a, 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 a really wonderful pirate who created Flatter, which is a good way uh, to Peter Sund, uh, who uh, was in prison for uh, his uh, role in uh, Pirate Bay. But uh, he created a platform that uh, has never taken off properly, but I thought it was a beautiful idea. How many of you are familiar with Flatter? Okay. Uh, so it's basically a micro payment uh, system where you can pay for uh, micro payments uh, if you go on a web page and you like it. And I, I love that, that actually somebody from Pirate Bay created that sort of platform to pay for content. You can also pay for songs and videos and whatever. So, but we tend to go into social media. And social media, uh, how many of you use MySpace? Okay, very few. Uh, I had a my, my, MySpace uh, uh, account, uh, and uh, because I was 
playing with music as well. But uh, it was a horrible, disgusting space, but it was turned into a social media space and then it everybody abandoned it. And now Twitter is starting to get abandoned. But Twitter was a very important sharing platform. And uh, so we can't rely on social media platforms to get stories out uh, because they have algorithms. And twi after Twitter introduced these uh, F uh, algorithms, um, <coughs> It's really crap, uh, and Facebook, Facebook uh, and, and one of the things we can do, actually, to help with um, ensuring that people have access to information is to demand that these social media companies like Facebook, Twitter, Google, reveal how their algorithms work. Because we can't, uh, every time you start to learn how to use it to share knowledge, they change the algorithms, and there's no way to know how. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now we are on a security conference, and uh, my question is, Jelena, um, what about the digital infrastructure and its vulnerability for, for, for citizen uh, journalists? So how can they protect? Like, um, there's a lot of issues about that. Um, I think we, as a pirate movement, have to help media and activisms activists and also citizen journalists um, about how to pre protect themselves. What's your experience yeah, I actually with that? think that pirates can do a lot for organizations who are operating on the internet and working, uh, doing, on, doing right things for the people on the internet. Um, I can't talk um, about a lot of um, citizen journalist media, but I was involved in Revolution News for three years, and I was correspondent for the cyber war zone, so I happen to know a bit about how it works. Um, either it's run by hackers or uh, malware researchers, and therefore it's kind of secure, though it can't last forever. Uh, or they need to be really lucky and deploy to, to find the right person uh, who will administrate the server and, and protect from DDoS. And also work on, anal on uh, analysis, um, what happens when, when news gets censored, for instance, in Romania or Saudi Arabia, because it also happens, and it happens on the level of internet service providers. Um, in the countries of South and East Europe, um, it's a little bit awkward because um, everything comes down to the people. So basically one phone call sometimes can be enough to get some media outlets outlet filtered on the national level on the internet. So it goes like this. Um, someone who doesn't like um, reporting of, let's say, revolution news about protests in Romania uh, makes a phone call. It's not recorded. There is no court warrant. He makes a phone call. And then all the media outlet, all the articles just get banned and filtered, and you get blank page. So it's always a hard thing to achieve, to be um, secure and to protect privacy and to be visible in all the countries. Um, the same thing is happening in the United States. They are certainly not, not, not much better. Um, they have banned, they have filtered videos of Al Jazeera. So um, some episodes cannot be seen at all. And recently, as you know, Al Jazeera even closed their offices in the United States. Um, when it comes to national level, I can only talk about my country, the uh, situation is quite similar. Um, media who report on, um, on corruption, they get DDoSed occasionally. Um, what is weird in all that is that sometimes the DDoS is actually fake. So we discovered that some, some, some kind of public outcries were basically aimed to get more donations from um, NDA and not to, not to actually have more secure website or more secure platform. So what pirates can do is to, and I really think so, we can join the crypto party movement and try to teach ourselves first and then to transfer the knowledge to other people how to encrypt laptop, um, how to encrypt your mobile phone. Mobile security is extremely important and nobody really talks about it a lot. And what is the right thing, how, how often we should change tools because, and how, how actually how investigative we should get about it. I have the feeling that if Tor was was financed by China or Russia, it would be a huge thing. Everyone would discuss it. But somehow Americans get free pass with that. And we just accept it. And I think it's actually the end of the imagination if you can't think of any, any other financial resource to get funding for some good project than the United States government. I have to say that. So yeah, when it comes to citizen journalism, 
Um, what pirates can do is to read it and share and disseminate and comment, and comment on it. And of course, give them a helping hand if they get DDoSed or censored. Or, and I also think the same thing about um, the, um, the organization where Christian Mir is. It's Reporters Without Frontiers, Without Borders. Um, they issue, they, they publish sometimes um, uh, huge charts and tables about corruption, about different kind of crime activities worldwide. And if we are global movement, we of course we, we need to care about that as well. So my best my best advice would be hire a hacker. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I want to speak about a last point um, concerning uh, also, uh, I think, a very, very important part of uh, digital media change. Uh, we have campaigning now. We have campaigning in the internet and we have collectivism. We have a big pla platform, everybody knows it, I guess. It's uh, called Avaz. And we have those petitions like, uh, I don't know the name, it's. Um, you know, where you just put your topic and you ask people to support it and you just put in your name, your email address, and then you are part of this petition. So, uh, Birgitta, what's, what's your uh, opinion on that? Is, is this digital media or is it just kind of, you know, a kind of collectivism? Do we get reach people with that? Do we get information transferred into society? Do we perceive any... Uh, value out of it, or is it just a, a sort of activism you don't need? What's your thing? Um, okay, so uh, I was uh, one of the first to start to use Avas, uh, and uh, uh, I have seen real results from it. Uh, and uh, when you manage to mobilize a lot of people, and uh, what before I the Iraq War, for example, there was the biggest or the largest mobilization of civilians trying to stop this war from happening. And uh, so that was the first online uh, organized uh, global event, uh, which people often forget. Uh, and, so uh, and so, you know, of course, if you only do the petition, then that's not good enough uh, because uh, you have to follow through with it. So I've, I've started a lot of petitions uh, myself. Uh, I did one petition when Bobby Fischer, the grand chess master, was uh, arrested in Japan uh, and put into prison. I put out the petition, Free Bobby, uh, and uh, he eventually got the Icelandic citizenship uh, to get him <laughs> out of uh, the danger of being um, persecuted for playing chess in the wrong country. Uh, uh, so I think uh, it's not enough just to do one thing. Uh, pirates in Iceland, for example, use uh, you know spy book a lot, uh, too much in my opinion. But it is unfortunately you can't get out of Facebook uh, unless you're willing to uh, miss birthday parties in your family and uh, all events and, and discussions. Uh, it's a horrible trap. Uh, so I think in general. Um, uh, we, I, th I, th I think um, it's important to have these uh, global and local platforms. There is, for, for example, a petition in Iceland now, uh, which has gained 60,000 uh, signatories. Uh, we are 330,000 people in Iceland, so it's a huge amount of the Icelandic population. It's a demand that... Um, more money is going to be put into the healthcare system, which is sort of uh, at a breaking point right now. And it's mobilized Icelanders and a lot of people that care about our, you know, making sure that the healthcare system is not going to be privatized. So you can use them, but you have to have other elements. It's not only about signing, but then carrying on with both uh, discussing why you're signing, and that's why it's great that uh, Avas forces you to share on Facebook that you signed. <laughs> I, I never, I always unfix it after. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, in general, um, the more empowerment, the better, but never underestimate the importance of actually meeting in the meat world, you know, to have this human interaction. It's, um, it's so much more powerful than uh, just clicking. So make the click count into a uh, I click. <laughs> yes. What's your uh, experience or, or or opinion on that, uh, Yelena? Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit scared of putting my email everywhere. 
so I have uh, really many emails which I put for the petitions. Um, but as someone who worked in the media and in NGO sector field, um, I'm quite aware of that, uh, that su success of petition depends on people who are behind it. So if they make a good PR, if they manage to put the public pressure on a government with that petition, fine. And in some countries it's not really regulated, so you don't really have a number of signatures you need to collect in order to get a referendum or in order to get that issue discussed in parliament, right? So petitions are great tool for uh, for creating a pressure on your government, but I'm always really thinking about those data, where they come from, uh, who are we who are we leaving our emails with, what they are going to do with it, because as I've seen on a, on a local level, um, one local website which is um, offering opportunity to sign a petition was kind of profiling football fans for two years. And then they opened up to the to, to rest of the NGOs and I was just thinking like checking on who is, you know, like who, who is the, the, the owner of the domain and what were the previous researches and it looked really obscure. So I would be, I would be really um, cautious about, about emails, but as for public initiatives, I really can't not support them <laughs> because Transparency Inter um, Amnesty International had a few really good campaigns and they have also awesome design uh, as well as Pirate Party UK so maybe design is something which, which we should consider as pirates also German Pirate Party has really awesome and controversial and provocative design and this is what gets people attention because we're living in, in, in deficit of attention on internet uh, it's the most um, most expensive resource on the internet to, is to grab somebody's attention and to keep it um, I think we should really use it wisely and I'm happy to have um, to have pirates like Birgitte Jon's daughter who are standing behind initiatives on the internet so finally the gap is closing between internet and real people yeah, the real world in the internet. Um, we are here in the real world too and we have a lot of guests sitting in the audience. So we have another half an hour for uh, discuss, discussing, sing, discussing uh, issues. And I would like to ask um, people in the audience if you have questions to some of us um, on the topics we discussed now or do you have a wish we shall talk about? So please feel free uh, to show your hands um, to, tell, to ask questions. Um, we will try to answer it. Yes. There was this, uh, there was this suggestion of making or forcing social media platforms to publish their algorithms to help people who make the right strategy or decisions essentially to get the citizen journalism information distributed enough. Let's just abstract it this way. Um, my question is, why do you think that would help? So what I currently observe is some social media platform does something. Nobody knows what it is, right? And then people experiment a bit, and after a while they more or less figure out what happens in their plus minus 10% of still non-understanding. But anyway, it's essentially a black box. People work around it, and then it information more or less flows again as people want it to. So I don't see much of a difference if they would publish the algorithms because then again they would build this huge amount of code and then they, the programmers or whoever would look through the code and after a while they would figure out how the effects actually are and then people would adapt. But they already do because instead of reading the code they just do experiments. So I don't see much of a difference in this well, by doing this. And I wonder whether it would... No, so I think the only effective op option would actually to mandate some kind of neutrality in there. I have no concrete proposal how to do it, but my question is why do you think just publishing the algorithms would achieve much? I wasn't talking about uh, publishing the code. I was talking about uh, notifying people about the changes that happen on the uh, biggest, according to Facebook, uh, largest community in the world which they want to democratize. 
uh, so uh, there is a weak demand that our democracies are open and transparent. Now, if uh, Facebook consider themselves, or Twitter, uh, and particularly Facebook consider themselves to have created, like uh, Mark Zuckerberg says all the time, the biggest community in the world, then that community and the rules in that community should be open and transparent. And the reason why I think it is important, like you, you are talking from like a coder perspective. Right? I'm talking about from the human beings that are using these platforms, have very little resources, do not necessarily understand how to get around it. Maybe they are in the beginning or in the middle of a campaign when everything changes, right? And so uh, those that have little resources to promote themselves, uh, they don't get around it. They wait for you, you guys to get around it, that are the coders, and that uh, is that is just, you know, and, and I have, I don't know how many times I've actually, because I am always engaged in so many different uh, activities, uh, and I don't know how many times uh, I realized that I put out a, some sort of awareness campaign throughout the years, uh, and all of a sudden the rules of the game have changed and nobody notified me in advance. Uh, and so the way, for example, the wall or the feet on Facebook is always changing, uh, you should be able to know in advance so you can then uh, be aware of that you're posting somebody and nobody sees it except five people. <laughs> so it's, it's and, and it's also like with Google, with their algorithms, uh, which is not about the issue that I was talking about earlier, but it is about the issue of if we want to get information and we never get the information uh, or know which information is being pushed at us, that is not very democratic, that is not informative, and is plain dangerous if you only get to see stuff you like. So it's also a question of consumer rights and getting stands in the parliamentary uh, way, like you get uh, laws for protecting consumers on a national level. So is there another question? Yes, please. Um, you, s you said, uh, Brigitte, that um, the media was not so keen to help the whistleblowers in, in the end. I mean, take, taking the, the, the example of Snowden, they have the, the Guardian people, for example, the Gu Guardian journalists uh, who traveled to Hong Kong said, after after um, Snowden sat there in, in Russia, he said, we, "Yeah, we we feel bad about we we could have helped him more." But how could they help him more? Because I mean, they could not invite him to to their country just because the laws were not were not there to 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 keep him safe. So wh what about could could you as a politician invite him to Iceland if he if he ever could travel? So is it not a a, a, um, a, a task for the politicians in the first place? I mean, a journalist have to kind of make the noise, but you have to provide for the laws to keep him safe. Yeah, I mean, uh, I said that uh, originally that Snowden has had the most media support of all whistleblowers, just to, to keep that straight. Uh, when it comes to uh, laws, so, um, for example, I have, uh, we put forward a bill uh, suggesting that Snowden would get uh, citizenship in Iceland. That is the best protection he could get. That would, though, mean that he couldn't go anywhere else and be stuck in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> which is maybe not very uh, yeah, it's not uh, nice country. very fascinating for uh, for your entire life. I mean, it's isolated. This is why I fell in love with the internet back in '95. Is that I finally got to be part of the world, and <laughs> not only like 300,000 souls. But of course, the legislators need to make sure that they protect whistleblowers. Uh, and but it is very tricky when you're part of international uh, extradition treaties. Uh, part of NATO, for example, and, and various other uh, treaties. So, for example, the German, I think it was the, some German parliamentarians wanted to give Snowden asylum. I have to stress asylum is not a very strong protection. It is much easier to extradite through asylum than citizenship. In Iceland, for example, no Icelandic citizen will be extradited. And I actually had to go through this myself when the US government went after me and my uh, metadata, my, my digital persona, there were uh, tangible uh, worries with uh, both in the Icelandic Parliament uh, and uh, in the Foreign Affairs Committee and uh, the Foreign Affairs uh, Ministry that uh, 
that if I would go to the United States, I would be in danger of being imprisoned. Uh, they strongly recommended I would not travel to the United States, and we went through all the extradition uh, laws in Iceland. If there was any possibility that there would be demands, I would be extradited. So as a citizen, I would not be extradited to other countries. But this is all different in all different countries. So uh, depending on... but. Uh, First, we have to make sure we have proper whistleblowing law for potential whistleblowers in the future in our own country. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Media plays a huge role, very important how the media portrays whistleblowers. The language, like when you say a leaker, it's a very negative term. When you say a revealer uh, or, you know, a person that uh, reports on crimes, for example. And that's a, it's like the way, and, and like me and Elena were talking earlier about, okay, so Serbia might have the best whistleblowing laws in the world. But at the same time, it takes a long time to get the culture to adapt to the new rules. And so it is also about how community perceives the new legislations and laws. Thank you. I, I have uh, to add something. Um, there was a conference some days ago um, from people who are active in uh, yeah, publishing the, not only the articles um, about Snowden, but also about the paper he, he leaked. So, and there are still more papers leaked uh, which are not uh, worked on by journalists. So I think um, a very, very important role of media should be to, to re review all the uh, documents Snowden and, and whistleblowers in the whole are uh, going to leak and it's their role to you know like interpret it like uh, tell people who are not in the in the technical details to tell them what's going on i think that's the uh, uh, most important part of media there and uh, we feel that it's getting better we see there are platforms protecting journalists also uh, we all know that glenn greenwald was attacked by government so we need protection of journalists there too um, and you have to make people aware of that, that you're getting uh, aggressions uh, if you, you're working together with whistleblowers. And then we have to put pressure on, jo on, on governments on that. So are there any more questions or do you want to, to add something? No, I was just thinking about Snowden revelations and I was thinking how um, he did a lot of things for United States government. He did them a good service and he basically gave them a hand to get out of that circle of hell where they are in right now. Uh, he also did a lot of good things for German government you had in your parliament, uh, that issue being debated and discussed and you agreed upon it. Uh, what I see as, a, as something which is not covered is like what's happening with the rest of the countries. It's not everything about Sweden and France and Germany and the United States, right? So uh, this is where I see the role of media. They need to localize the issues. So once when, when, when NSA servers are discovered, they have to dig further what's happening in it, in that facility, right? Or uh, I would, I would local if I'm a journalist, but I'm not. I was a journalist when I started my career. I had to start somewhere. So I was a journalist for the first six years. Um, if I'm a journalist, I would really tackle the issues of um, how banks, banks are giving out data of their clients to American government and under what law. So there, there are some um, laws which are uh, made to, to, to stop um, crime rings and terrorism. And they exist in UK, they exist in Serbia, and usually it's behind the, behind the closed doors. Um, it happens that banks are actually giving out data or your financial transactions and the ownership of your, of your funds to foreign governments without anyone knowing about it. So where I come from, we have data commissioner who is really actually doing his job really well. So he has um, a year's, like um, every year he has a review of how uh, institutions are treating our private data. And he sends them some questionnaire. They reply mostly with copied and pasted answers. So it's obvious that it comes from one source um, with spelling mistakes. <laughs> and they get fines for that, but that's not enough. Sometimes uh, institutions are rather, they're, they are more willing to pay the fines than to, re than to reveal the information or to change that 
uh, CMS they're working in and to put that one little column which says uh, is there a court order for this or not. So, so that's the big issue. We have to um, bring everything down to the literally CMS and people. Um, some better banks um, are actually taking notes of who is accessing data and uh, with what reason. But in most of the cases, it's not happening. It's just being discovered um, randomly and accidentally. Then it gets into the press, and then government reacts. In countries like Ireland, there is nobody to react. They have data commissioner, which is which he, who actually brought Facebook um, to, to Ireland and brought investments and is not really caring about privacy of all of us Europeans because all the servers are in Dublin, right? So um, I would advise strongly to um, try to empower your existing institutions like Ombudsman and Data Protection Commissioner for one and then to make of course a lot of noise on internet because so far it, always pro it, it was always proven as, as the best possible tactic. Yeah. Yes, yes, please. Uh, uh, we were discussing uh, before the panel um, that, uh, like, for example, there is this uh, whistleblowing act in, in Serbia, and it's probably in Serbian. Uh, and so it would be really great if uh, all these different uh, part party uh, uh, organizations around the world would create a uh, global database on the best practices translated so that when, let's say, pirates get uh, to have influence in other parts of the world, uh, they can go into this database and they don't have to start on square one. And that is so important about this internet knowledge sharing. And the same thing, like, for example, for journalists, because I know it is a very difficult time in journalism in general because uh, the legal departments are often larger than uh, the investigative journalist departments. And, of course, the sport department is always biggest. Uh, and uh, so I was thinking, like, a while ago when I was really involved with WikiLeaks and all these different other uh, organizations that were trying to organize them to provide uh, um, uh, platforms that were similar to WikiLeaks, uh, that it would be so, like for example, we're here at the security conference, and, and if there would be this one global leak site that was not only focused on mega leaks like WikiLeaks is now, uh, that would focus on different global topics just that week, so people that had information, for example, related to the discussions at the Munich Security Conference, could uh, leak stuff and journalists would use that as a platform and maybe make collectives of uh, knowledge sharing like it's sometimes done. Like, For example, it was really unique and it's been very little discussed uh, what happened in relation to how the, the reporting was of these mega leaks from WikiLeaks where you had different media outlets from uh, Britain, Germany, the United States collaborating in uh, creating a comprehensive idea and, and reporting about the information that was to be dug out of this massive amounts of uh, data. And so uh, I would like to see more collaborations between media on big important issues uh, so that uh, uh, they can be both uh, more in depth but also uh, more discussions uh, globally. Okay, thank you, Birgitta. So, are there any questions to us? I can't see any more. You, you want to add something? Yes? I, I, I sure have more questions. <laughs> Perfect. Um, you, s you spoke, Birgitta, um, before in, in your, I think, in your intervention that um, we, we are in danger to lose democracy to kind of can you elaborate a little on that? And can you especially elaborate on the solutions to that that you can think of? It's to you both, certainly, or to you all. Yes, okay, uh, thanks for bringing out one of my favorite topics. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm very concerned about the lack of trust in the democratic institutions. Uh, and it reminds me of a time in history that no one, no one uh, wants to repeat. Uh, and um, so in Iceland, for example, there's only 10% trust in the parliament. Uh, ever since the crisis, it's not been possible to uh, re-establish trust. And it is institutional because it's uh, the way the structures, uh, the way we run our societies uh, are built, very old, 
and uh, people are sick of the theater uh, and they want to see real results and to have influence. So that is why I promote uh, a lot uh, as a solution is to both strengthening the, the parliamentary process to make policy being done there, not in the ministries, because that's where you have all the all the people, all the representatives from all the different parties, uh, and you get rid of this majority ruling that we have grown accustomed to, and has very little to do with democracy. And then, of course, the laws uh, are written by lobbyists in the ministries. There's very little transparency about who writes what bit. If the policy and the legal writing would be in the hands of the legislator. Uh, because, uh, because that's, that's what the original idea behind democracy is that the, the representatives would be the legislators strong with strong parliaments where, where they would get enough, enough support, support uh, in, uh, the in the parliaments to write uh, uh, the laws for all. But now, but now the, ones the ones that are supposed to execute, execute the laws the are writing the laws. That's one, that's way, one way of strengthening the democracy. Another way is one of the things that <coughs> made me really like the concept of the pirate parties was the uh, experimentation in bringing democracy closer to the general public. Uh, and we are still in um, a phase in our world where that is being like the platforms to do so are being created, uh, the direct democracy platforms and the laws are very slowly being changed. To, to give people access. That is, that is one of the things that I see are very important. But if, but if we, don't we don't do something, the populists uh, that, uh, that are now so getting so much support in our world, in our world and, in and in particular in Europe, and, you know, and you know, in the United States, States Donald Trump, Trump. Uh, and, and, it's uh, and it's actually a real reality, reality that this guy could become a president. You know, you know it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, this shows how, how dangerous, dangerous it is to leave a vacuum uh, for, people for people to be able to thrive on people's fears. And that is, and what, that is what the populists do. And so, and so uh, <coughs> many people are glad that the Pirate Party is getting the unhappy people to support us instead of some neo-Nazis uh, that are all over Europe now. So we have to strengthen the parliaments and the, the trust in it, and we do that by opening the process and bringing more power into it. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> well, I see um, a way to bring more democracy to people um, as, as complementary with what, what Internet is for. So uh, Internet kind of flattens this world, right? It's a little bit flatter. You can actually reach to anyone. You can talk to Birgitta on Twitter, even if she's a, a future prime minister of Iceland. So it's different. It makes, it makes our lives, the way we connect, the way we fall in love, the way we communicate about politics, it makes different. Um, where I come from, um, uh, that kind of crowdsourcing laws is called um, ethical politics, and it doesn't exist. It's recognized as an issue. Uh, that politicians need to be open, need to be on Twitter, need to have email and phone number published. And also their websites, like Julia Reda, where they can explain what they are doing and why they are doing, and crowdsource the idea from their party and outside the party. So it's been recognized within some women network in parliament as an issue. Like, okay, uh, in this country nobody is doing politics on that way, ethical and nothing has been done. So, so I would really advocate a strong penetration of internet into the all segments of parliament and politics, and especially when it comes to lobbying, because um, all the deals which are brought behind closed doors are apparently really bad for us. So um, you basically have a one same group of people writing laws about tobacco, and then about uh, uh, military weapons, and then about well, not about privacy, but about different sorts of trade. And uh, when you ask them, okay, but what have you studied? How can you know everything about tobacco and then about weapons and then about police? And they just say, I don't. I just get papers from somewhere. <laughs> so um, internet is here to stay. And I really think we should amplify the power of internet and change the politics in terms of getting it right to the people and getting ideas from the people, not in terms of like making focus group, uh, groups and then telling what people expect to hear, but in terms of really involving people in the creation of, uh, of new laws.
Yeah, I'd like to add um, a, a short story about a German website. Uh, it's called Frag den Staat, Ask the Government. Uh, there was a, s a slot on the last uh, com <coughs> com um, uh, CCC um, in uh, Hamburg about Verklag den Staat. So um, activists changed to not only ask the government, but they built a platform uh, to file a, a complaint against their government. So that shows that we have to get more aggressive to get those information and more aggressive to, yeah, to get participation in democracy back. So fight it back. I think that's a good point um, on, yeah, closing this panel. I think uh, we all need a short break. Uh, I would half-heartedly thank you, you two, and, and also you as an audience uh, to participate.